So I'm an intervention cardiologist, but I will debate for the surgeons, and I'm thinking that SAVR is still relevant. So I'm going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly in TAVR. And of course, I have to give some credit to Dr. Reardon. And as he said, in high surgical risk, we know that TAVR is definitely an alternative. He represented all the intermediate risk uh, cases and, and data, so I'm not going to go through that. But we already know that um, all the outcomes that are important show that TAVR um, is at least equivalent, if not superior in some instances. And if we go through uh, all the different companies, we have almost the same results, which is also good news um, for all of us. So um, the, the other good news is if you go to TAVR, and we have seen, uh, shown this and others have done this, um, it's not only good for the patients, but probably also good for your institution uh, because uh, you save money, and if you then go from uh, just going femoral to conscious sedation, which obviously the surgeons will never do, um, you save additional money. So just, for example, showing here our data, you save probably a million dollars a year if you go temp uh, femoral and then conscious sedation. But, you know, those are just the good things. I wanted to give some credit, uh, Dr. Reardon, but here comes the bad. So here's an interesting uh, study that was just published, and it shows the the trends um, in the off-label use of, of TAVR. And interestingly so, 10% uh, of um, patients receiving TAVR in the registry actually have already received this off-label, which is kind of an interesting result. One out of 10 patients is considered an off-label patient. So, and if you look at the mortality of the off-label versus on-label uh, use, you see that there is some difference. It's maybe not statistically significant, but if you look at the hospitals who do a lot of off-label, they actually have even higher trends in mortality. So as expected, once the interventional cardiologists have a new tool, they're just using it everywhere. And then in trials, we are very, very tight on the inclusion-exclusion criteria, but once you get out in the real world, you're using it everywhere. So you have to be very careful there not to use the TAVR device uh, too frequently and without um, good discussion of the heart team. Now it comes to the ugly, and he mentioned it a little bit, and it comes up in some slides, and he almost, you know, was hiding it in the tables there. Yeah, yeah, tiny. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think that the pacemaker is certainly uh, where it gets kind of ugly. Um, so when you look at, um, for example, the CHOICE trial, I'm going to go through a couple ones, but in 2014 here, if you compare the two different technologies, and I don't want to have them uh, fight each other, but you see that there's a significant um, use of pacemaker implantations. Yeah? And if you look at the Sertavi investigators uh, trial here, surgery, 6.6%. And if you look through all these trials, it's usually between 6 and 8%, I would say, pacemaker needed. But uh, we have a significant amount, and we can debate uh, what the uh, true number there is, but we have a significant amount of pacemaker use. Now, you could say, well, what does it matter? Because Dr. Reardon just said, well, there's just a little bit more pacemaker use. That's what he said. But actually, there's more and more data coming out showing us that that is not a benign problem, right? So if you look at this, for example, I just picked one, you have an increased mortality in heart failure readmissions when you implant a pacemaker. So give that some thought, right? So we have to really get into that. Either we fix that problem somehow, or maybe we shouldn't implant pacemakers too liberally, or maybe the surgeons should take over uh, the field again if this is really an issue. And now the possibly ugly. Um, I said possibly because I, I agree with Dr. Riyad and maybe the data are not very strong enough, but I think this can get ugly. Um, as just recently published, we know that um, all TAVR valves have um, a tendency, not all of them, but a, a certain percentage, and we're going to look at that, of um, valve thrombosis, or um, we can also look at it as leaflet motion issues. And if you look at this um, publication here in The Lancet, you see that this is three times more than in the surgical valves. Now, we had some interesting talk this morning um, thinking about what the differences might be, what's the engineering, but that's not part of this topic, but it's three times more. Now, does that matter? Yes, it does, because 
Um, although this is maybe a, a smaller trial, we have to look at more patients, but it matters. Patients have TIAs. They luckily don't have major strokes, but if you would tell me that you uh, might create a TIA in, in me, that, that could scare me. And uh, the other thing is that we have to consider is if we actually stop the anticoagulation. So if you have a valve thrombosis and you started on Coumadin, three months later, Coumadin is stopped in the expectation that everything is cured might not be the truth in TAVR valves. Um, so this is small numbers, we're really early, but there is a 50% recurrence rate of um, valve thrombosis. So I think that can get ugly and it can also uh, be one of the reasons why we see all of these uh, early degenerations in bioprosthetic valves. Maybe we have underestimated that in, in the past. Now, um, I think also that a surgeon can offer the patient a, a one-stop shop, and I'm going to go into the details here. So here's the advantages which I, which I think uh, the surgeon has. Of course, like Dr. Uh, Feldman pointed out, if you have a bicuspid aortic valve, we have some good data already that if you need to go for TAVR, that actually the newer generation valves have a pretty good outcome. And uh, Dr. Webb is there, of course, the leading author. Um, but what, what if we have this? You know, the sending aortic aneurysm and, of course, the aortopathy is part of bicuspid aortic valve disease. Clearly, if I would be a surgeon, I would say I, as a surgeon, um, I can repair this much more efficiently. I don't have any tools for the intervention cardiologist to fix this. And just to go over that and say, okay, well, it's probably likely to be good, it's not a good idea because four or five years later, and even if you create some trauma during TAVR to this uh, aortopathy, that might be not good. So by, I think bicuspid aortic valve disease is certainly still a, a surgical uh, venue. Now, coronary disease, uh, I'm surprised that Dr. Reardon didn't discuss that at all as an interventional cardiologist, but um, so if you have severe coronary artery disease, does that really matter? And there's a lot of data showing us that it may not matter, but more and more uh, we really learn that it, it does matter. So for example, this uh, publication here by Whitberg and Kronofsky, if you look at uh, complete revascularization, and you can argue about that um, name uh, quite a bit, but if you uh, perform TAVR in a patient that was not completely revascularized, and this is shown here in a so-called residual syntax score of uh, more than eight, and if anybody who did a syntax score of um, calculation, eight is not too difficult to get, right? So I mean, mid LED lesion, RCA lesion, some bifurcation in there. So it, it can get there that easily. So you have a significant um, mortality deficit if you leave the coronary disease alone. Now obviously the surgeon uh, can do a pretty good job there. And is that true? Well, if you look at uh, Mayo Clinic's data, um, you have a significant uh, improvement in mortality if you actually do a complete revascularization uh, during an aortic valve surgery. So we have to keep that in mind. We can't just overgo a coronary disease and say we're just going to put the valve in, especially if we now go into immediate low-risk uh, patients. Um, overall, you can see here that the benefit of uh, doing cabbage uh, versus no cabbage is quite significant. Atrial fibrillation, again, also one of those topics I think we overgo quite quickly. Um, as the uh, TAVR implanter, you almost have no option there. Some upcoming uh, trials with the Watchman device. But if you have atrial fibrillation and you are uh, someone who can do a MACE procedure quite uh, nicely, let's say this is, I think, a MACE 4 uh, procedure, you can offer the patient, an, uh, based on this result, for example, a 70, maybe 80% chance to get rid of atrial fibrillation. In addition to that, uh, you can use one of those clipping devices. This is the Atricura device where you can actually isolate the uh, appendage from the circulation. So you offer them an ablation procedure and exclusion of the appendage in addition to aortic valve surgery and maybe even by bypass. So definitely we need uh, good surgeons who keep up with these skills because that's not something a intervention cardiologist can do. Uh, low risk experience, right? So we, we um, didn't go into it and I agree the Nordic trial is uh, definitely not um, uh, powered for that, but it's, I think it's one of those trials that gives us some idea in which direction we're going to go. And for sure, again, if you look at um, outcomes here, mortality, stroke, or MI, and SAVR, and TAVR, 
um, and like Dr. Reardon said, we're going to see that most likely um, Sava and Tava, again, are going to have equivalent uh, results. But here's the problem. Um, while he is right that there's a lot of atrial fibrillation in uh, surgery, I'm not sure if they actually used advanced technologies for isolation, there was a high, high percentage of pacemaker um, implantations. Now, this is a very unusually high implantation rate, and you can argue about this. That will be a different talk. But there's no doubt pacemaker implantations were just high. Now, when we do redo surgery, that's also often a, a, a controversial topic, but many people think that if you do redo surgery, that's already a problem. Now, if you look actually at most recent data, that's not necessarily true. This is from uh, Ranki et al. So if you do a redo um, surgery, their mortality is actually quite good. 4.7, less than expected. Stroke, yes, but acceptable. And pacemaker implantations, very acceptable. How about a, a redo or a aortic valve surgery that in patients who had cabbage before, also something people get really scared about. But if you look at those data, outcomes really, really good. I'm going to keep this up here for a while. Now, there's not a lot of data out there, but this is, this is really good. Yeah. So I think that um, overall, SAVA is still needed definitely in bicuspid aortic valve disease, so we shouldn't overgo that. Um, I think overall we should, we should think twice when we use it off-label because mortality deficit is there. If you have a high syntax score, severe coronary disease, or if you expect that your residual syntax score is high, I think you should definitely talk to your surgeon again before you put the TAVA valve in. And then if you're higher risk for permanent pacemaker and risk scores are being developed and you have to think about this, this is not a benign problem uh, that we can overgo. If you have some history of thrombophilia or some thrombus in your past, maybe that's time to think about this potential problem of 12% uh, valve thrombosis. And low risk trials are obviously ongoing and, and we don't know yet. Um, I think it's, at some point it's time that we, we kind of rethink our heart team soon because uh, it came from this very high risk and now we're you know, sliding into the low risk uh, population. I think at least we need to really uh, get to a better discussion as soon as we uh, enter the low risk uh, tab or commercial phases so that we are not overgoing the surgeons because if we lose the surgical skills, that's not going to be good. So there's a lot of patients still that need a good surgeon with all the um, good benefits of it. So my argument is that SAVR is still needed in many patients. We do have some time for a little further discussion and, uh, and thoughts and questions. Uh, so feel, there's some mics in the room, so please feel free to step up and uh, offer your comments as you like. Um, one thing that came to my mind, Michael, as I was listening to you speak, what will happen to the surgical AVR expertise as TAVR gets adopted? You know, right now you, you talk about O to E's being incredibly low and among the lowest we've ever seen in surgery uh, treatment of AS. How is that going to change when TAVR is done more frequently and perhaps surgery might be done a little bit less? Well, you know, there, there's already been that experiment done, and it's called the uh, EVAR and vascular surgery. You know, when I grew up, we did all these open aneurysms. I did my first open aortic aneurysm as a third-year general surgery resident. You know, we, we were doing them all the time. And so you, you practice on a whole lot of them. Then when the first juxtarenals and the type 4 thoracos came up, you had already done a bunch of this stuff. My, my vascular colleagues now, all the aneurysms they fix coming up from training have been done with catheters, almost all of them. And in fact, my case on Monday when I get back before I leave Tuesday for Israel to operate is a very complex open vascular case because none of my vascular faculty have ever seen anything like what we're going to do. And so I'll be in there helping them. The problem is, is what, do you ha what happens when you run out of the old guys that, that did it you know, early on? And, and it's going to be problematic. Now, one answer is, well, you don't need the suture valves anymore. We'll just put in these, these towers on a stick that we have now, like the, like the Percival valve or the Intuity valve. And they're really slick valves and they're easy. But you know, then now we're back to now you're using a new valve that has no proven durability. We're just doing TAVR on a stick rather than TAVR on a catheter. Um, it, it is problematic. Um, and, you know, one wonders if it's going to drive people towards center of excellence. But, you know, we've all been talking about valve centers of excellence for the last two decades. It still hasn't happened across the country. I, 
I don't think this is a problem. This is the definition of disruptive technology. Um, we saw uh, the disappearance of gastric <coughs> surgery with the discovery that ulcer disease is bacterial. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't see that this is so different uh, and we should be celebrating rather than lamenting the uh, demise of traditional aortic valve replacement. The demise. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I think what I heard there, I think we have demise. To give, we have, we have to give Mario a lot of credit because you know, <laughs> everything Mario said was true. I mean, you know, the, the surgery's not going to go away. And in fact, you know, the, the, the worrisome thing about this with my surgical colleagues is that they're worried that if low risk gets approved, everybody in the world's going to have a TAVR. And that's just, that's just not true. You know, we're not going to send 35 year olds for TAVRs. Mm -hmm. We're not going to send people with aortic aneurysms that are good surgical candidates for TAVR. You know, there, there are going to still going to be a number of, of reasons why people come. And the interesting thing for me is that when we have our heart team discussion, it's often my cardiologists that are pushing hardest to have somebody operate on because we've been doing it for them for three decades. And if it's kind of on the fence, they're often saying, no, no, you, you really ought to just operate on this. This is a low risk guy, just operate on them. And I'm on their side going, I need to fill my trial. Uh, so, you know, I, I think in good centers, there's always going to be, there's always going to be a role for surgery and, you know, but the good news is that I put my daughters through college and graduate school, married them, and my house is paid for, so go have at it, guys. <laughs> so, based on the comments to solve is that you lost the debate, Mario, I think uh, people say about the mice. Um, the, the question relates to valve durability, and I know we have many unanswered questions at this point, but I wonder if you want to comment on, as we move to low-risk patients, you know, choosing valve sizes, I see through these valve conferences when patients are being discussed for surgical versus TAVR valves. And I'm thinking, well, a young patient in 10 years, he may need another valve. And I'd rather do a volume valve procedure in a 29 S3 rather than a 23 surgical valve. Usually, TAVR valves tend to be much bigger than surgical valves. Is that something that you think about or you think is going to be a factor when deciding which valve I put in? a procedure that may be needed 10 years down the road? Well, it, I mean, it is, it is for us, and as a surgeon, you really ought to be thinking, first of all, about avoiding patient prosthetic mismatch to begin with. And, and, and to do that, for most average-sized men, a guy your size, you need a 23-valve or bigger. If you have a 23-valve, you're going to do great with, with, with TAVR and, 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 and SAVR. If I put a 19 in you, you're, you're going to suck wind no matter what. And so there's a couple one things that either you can just make the annulus bigger, which... If you go to a site where people do a lot of aortic valve surgery, it's not a big deal, but the average heart surgeon does eight aortic valves a year. So to add an annular enlargement to that is, is, is a big deal. The stentless valves, uh, the freestyle, or things like the Percival or the Intuity, the Intuity is a really a stented valve, but the Percival is a nitinol valve. You, know, you could put a balloon expandable in there and overexpand it if you need it. So that they, they do behave a little bit more like a natural valve than a stent-mounted valve. But no, I think about that every day. I, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm loath to put anything less than 23 in a man. A yep. uh, couple of questions that I don't think were uh, discovered and are talked about. Uh, one of which is anatomical considerations of the root, like LVOT calcium in an individual patient that may favor even an intermediate risk patient to be... Uh, steered in one direction versus the other, or definitely a low-risk patient, for example. And the other thing that I didn't uh, hear discussed was femoral versus alternative access uh, TAVR, uh, other than subclavian, which is sort of like a femoral, but other than a subclavian, like more, more, more invasive alternative accesses versus minimally invasive aortic replacement surgery. Uh, in the low risk group. I'd be curious to hear Mike's comments and then Ted and Mario's comments. Well, just on the last, before we go to the excess and calcium, one comment on valve sizing, and that is uh, the recent realization that we can uh, break surgical valve sewing rings with a balloon to put in a bigger TAVR device has, I think, totally changed the conversation about valve and valve in our world today. And the, the second comment is uh, that our colleagues in industry are developing uh, surgical valve prostheses that are made to be broken. So that I, I think that is already becoming a historical uh, issue. 
So my valve uh, access and calcium. Well, yeah, and it may not all valves. We can't break all valves. There's some that no. you just can't, can't break. Um, well, if, if I have to put a hole in your chest, it's a bad thing. You know, so anything, any access that does not put a hole in your chest is better than an access that does put a hole in your chest. And I used to debate Tommy Walter every year about direct aortic versus transapical, and Tommy would always get up and say that transapical was just as good as transfemoral. And I kept telling him, Tommy, quit saying that. People are going to think you're crazy. You know, you might as well become president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's just not true. If I put a hole in your chest, it's, it's a bad thing. You do not do as well as, as, trans, as transfemoral. And, and so th there, is, there is a difference. So as you move up the risk scale, if I can't do transfemoral, I, I, will, I will flop over to cohort C a lot sooner if it takes something that I can't do a non-hole in the chest approach. LVOT calcium, yeah, I mean, that, that's usually a, a little piece of calcium that melts like wax down the oral mitral curtain onto the anterior leaflet. Surgeons, we just peel it off. It just peels off. It's easy breezy. Um, you know, so it depends on the risk. In, in, in our Evolute low risk trial, it, we have some parameters that if, there's, if it sticks out more than this in the LVOT and it's longer than this, we won't let you put them in the trial. And the reason we won't is because we don't believe it's safe. We don't believe there's equipoise. You know, mm -hmm. it's a safety issue. But it's a challenging metric, though, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, because we don't really have good ways at quantifying or determining what's going to cause a rupture or, or such. You know, it's really, it's almost like, you know, the adage of pornography. You know it when you see it. It's just, it's ugly and you don't want to touch it. But I think that's one of the difficulties with choosing. And we've had patients presented for low risk in which the calcification just looked really bad. And uh, we couldn't say it any other way except that it just looked bad and we felt the patient would have surgery. And then we've had patients in whom the calcification was not severe and they've had problems. And, uh, and it's, I, I think it's one area that I wish we could predict better, but we just, we just can't. And the thing is, outside the context of the trial, it's one thing when you have a screening committee call once a week to go over the case. But once the trial is done, there's no such inclusion and exclusion in the IAT. That's right. Right. But, but I, I would counter with a question for you. I mean, how often do you really encounter that patient that is a good surgical candidate and you and the surgeon debate about LVO2 calcification or any other access issues? I usually what happens, I think, in the majority is that the patient is actually so high risk that the surgeon pushes you almost towards TAVR, and then the only decision you have to make is which of the TAVR valves is the safest in, in, that, in that setting. I see, and I agree with Paul, there's not really a risk score, but really it hasn't been a big, big issue, right? I mean, no matter what valve you're using, you have maybe paravalvular ligand if you're not too oversizing too much. So I, I haven't encountered that, that discussion in a low-risk patient, really. Yeah. Yeah. We've, 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 uh, we've excluded people from the Evolute Low Risk Trial. I know what happens in Partner 3. I've talked to Mike and Marty about it. I mean, I don't know about this pornography stuff. I've never seen anything. I guess that's a cardiology <laughs> issue. So it's a cardiology issue. But I know a lot about oh calcium. Uh, <laughs> we, we also have advances in technology that are helping deal with calcium. So the skirts, uh, valves, skirted valves are, are a part of it and specifically our experience with Lotus Valve, which has an expansion mechanism uh, that is forgiving, uh, has been really positive with that subgroup. So I, I actually think this is a discussion that's going to diminish in relevance as we develop our devices. I mean, again, remember, we, we've been doing this. I mean, when was the very first one done by, uh, you know, Carpentier? Uh, I mean, Pribier, the other, other French guy. Uh, you know, it was like 2002. Well, for me, 2002 was just yesterday. I mean, it was almost just right around the corner. And, and you, look at, you look at where we've come. I mean, that's why when I started to predict forward to 2020, you, you know, a lot of these things are going to be overcome by engineering, engineering uh, issues. I mean, if you looked at where, if, where heart surgery, heart valve surgery was compared to the very first heart valve put in, we were still killing off people left and right. And we, you know, we were using, you know, we tried with, that was about the time of the ISQ Shiley valve. We had these horrible tissue valve failures and we had gone back to the mechanical valves. I mean, you know, we've had six decades to, to perfect surgical aortic valve replacement. And it's, it's not going to go away. I, keep, I tell the young surgeons, you know, there's going to be plenty to do. Become an expert in this. And there's going to be plenty to do because the number of people they're training that are going to be experts are going down every year. Mm -hmm. And so in 10 years, 
somebody that does this really, really well yeah. is going to be sitting in the catbird seat because we're, really, not, we're not going to have yeah. no need for surgeons. There's going to be a great need for good surgeons. It'll be really interesting to see what happens with that O to E ratio in about 20 years. Yeah. You know, and, I mean, we won't have probably good risk benchmarking uh, to say exactly what the O should be, but it'll be very interesting to see uh, what, what that will be because it'll be a very different patient population and different expertise. Yeah. yeah.